Okay, it's uh, 5.30, so let's go ahead and get started today. Um, so hello everybody, uh, how's everybody doing? Yeah, good, yeah, we're in uh, week four, um, so the semester's flying by. Um, so I, I think, you know, no doubt, you know, you all got the, uh, um, the emails either from Chancellor White or from President Virgie last week. So, um, you know, we're gonna be like this for, you know, the, until next summer, which is, you know, kind of hard to believe that, you know, we'll be spending over a year in, in virtual instruction like this, but, you know, we gotta do what we gotta do. You know, we gotta keep everyone safe. So, you know, I think this is, uh, you know, it's good that, you know, at least, you know, to some degree, I think we're all getting kind of used to this virtual instruction. So I think it's, it's you know, good that we're doing this. Yeah. Uh, okay, uh, so the plan for today is that we're going to um, continue on with the lecture notes on trusses. Um, so I'm going to try to finish, but I, I think there's a little bit too much uh, content to cover in one day, so we'll probably uh, finish this up on Wednesday. Okay? Um, and so besides that, I know there's there's a homework out, and um, you know it's uh, you guys could probably do um, at least the at least the first problem, and then after today you'll definitely be able to do the problem three as well. And three, four, three and four, um, and so I think you know there's there. I already found a typo in uh, the solutions for problem two, um, two B, and it seems like there might also be a typo in the solution for problem three B as well. Um, so I'm going to double check those after the lecture today. Um, but besides those, are there uh, any questions that I can answer about the homework, or just anything else that we covered last week? Last week was a short week, so yeah, we didn't cover too too much. Okay, um, so if you have any questions on, on anything, definitely, uh, you know, don't be afraid to shout it out. So you can either uh, turn on your mic or you can um, message me in the chat, okay? Okay, so let's continue on, right? So I think where we left off last week was, um, you know, we, we're starting to think about problems in two dimensions um, for our finite element problems, okay? And so in order to, to do problems in 2D, we need a second uh, coordinate direction. So uh, up to this point, we've only been working in one dimensional problem. So we just kind of implicitly assume that that was the X axis. But in 2D, we need to add a second axis. So now we're, we're gonna add the Y, okay? And so what's complicated about these 2D problems is that um, oftentimes what's, um, what's going to happen is that you're gonna have an element that's not gonna be um, aligned perfectly with the, with the coordinate axes, okay? And so uh, in order to properly um, um, analyze these, we need to analyze everything within the same coordinate system. The problem with this is that, you know, if we go, if we kind of follow the process in which we've been using for finite element problems, um, you know that the first step is always to form the element stiffness matrix. Okay? And so the problem with the, the problem with, you know, solving everything in terms of the same coordinate system is that, you know, if you're going to form the element stiffness matrices for the element, the element stiffness matrices implicitly assume that you're, with, you're within a coordinate system that's local to the element. And so in order to properly analyze 2D problems, we're, we're gonna have elements that are pointing in very different directions. We need to be able to transform them into one kind of global stationary coordinate system, okay? And so that's kind of where we left off, okay? So let me kind of draw the same figure that which we left off at. And so uh, on the one hand, we have what's called our stationary coordinate system, which is you know, our traditional x, y um, coordinates. And these guys are not gonna move. That's why we call them stationary, okay? And then in our stationary coordinates, 
we can just have a core, an arbitrary vector u. So we'll call, we'll call that vector u, right? And then the components of this vector in that stationary coordinates, we'll say u is ui, ux, and uy. And so on the other hand, um, parallel to the stationary coordinate system, we also have a another coordinate system that might be rotated. Okay? And let's say that we know uh, the angle in which this, uh, this coordinate system is rotated. So we can say that this coordinate system angle is uh, uh, rotated um, by an angle theta. Okay? And we can draw the same vector u. Okay? So these two u's are, are the same. It's just that the way that we describe them is going to be different because the, the coordinate systems are, are going to be different. Okay? So this will be like a local coordinate system where the local, where, you know, we, we know that the local coordinate system might align with the, uh, the axis of one of the elements. Okay? And then within the local coordinate system, this vector u would have its own components u hat and y hat. Okay? And so uh, what we want to do is we're going to come up with a way to kind of transform in between these two coordinate systems so that we can uh, write element stiffness matrices you know, within the stationary coordinates, which is what we need to do to do problems. Okay. All right, are there any questions on, on this? This is just a recap from, uh, from last week. Okay. And so the uh, kind of the, the key equation that we want to, uh, that we want to work with is this guy right here. So our key equation is that uh, you know on the left hand side of this of this equal sign we have the um, the coordinates of this uh, of this vector u within the local system, okay. or the uh, stationary system. Sorry. And since this u is the same vector in both systems, you know, it doesn't matter what our coordinates are, you know, they should, they should be the same. Okay? And so if we write the same components with the, um, unit, uh, with the corresponding unit vectors in the local system, these two guys should be the same. And so the only thing that's different is that the components and the unit vectors within each coordinate system are going to be different. Okay? And so the way that we're going to uh, work on this equation is that we want to express the unit vectors in the local system in terms of the unit vectors in the, uh, the unit vectors in the stationary system. We want to express those in terms of the unit vectors in the local system. So I think we did the first part of this last time. As, um, as so uh, we found an expression for i right here. Okay, and the way we did that was we we drew the unit vector i, and so we know the unit vector i just goes horizontally to the right because it's aligned with the positive x-axis in the stationary coordinate system. Okay, and then the way that we expressed it in the local system was we drew, you know, a triangle here. Okay, where the where the legs of this triangle are parallel to the axes of the local system. And then just by using uh, uh, you know, geometry here, what we found was that I, the unit vector in the, in the stationary system, is equal to cosine theta I hat minus sine theta J hat. Okay. Right. And so uh, with this expression, we can plug in for i back up here, okay, and then we can eliminate one of the variables in our uh, in our equation. Okay? And so what we'll do today is we'll uh, we'll do we'll get a similar expression for j, okay, 
And then once we plug in for J, everything will be in terms of I hat and J hat. And then we can, uh, we can actually manipulate this and actually get a, a transformation matrix out of it. Okay. All right, any questions on, on this? Okay. Okay, so let's do the same thing for J. So let's express J in terms of I hat and J hat. Okay. And so, uh, you know, it always helps to draw a figure. So let's draw a J vector. So we know J is a unit vector, so it has a has magnitude one, and it points straight up because that's the uh, direction of the y um, of the y axis in our stationary system. Okay. And then what we're going to do, same thing we did with the i uh, with the i vector, is that we're going to form a triangle by using unit vectors in the um, uh, in the i hat and the j hat directions. Okay. And so in the j hat direction, we might have a vector that looks like this. And so this could be like B hat right here. Okay. And then in the X hat direction, we have a vector A hat right there. Okay. And then this could be theta. Okay. okay. And so just like we did with um, the I vector, let's express the magnitude of B and A in terms of J. So let's see, so let's do um, A first, okay? And so the magnitude of A hat, if we just go by, uh, just by the geometry here, it will be sine theta, okay? Times the magnitude of J, right? But since J is a unit vector, this is just gonna be one right here, okay? okay? And so the next thing is we're gonna do the magnitude of B, which is the uh, uh, a vector in the j hat direction, right? And just by going off the geometry here, this is going to be cosine theta times magnitude of j, where again magnitude of j is just going to be one. Okay. And so if we combine these guys, we can say that j is equal to sine theta sine theta um, i hat. Because remember, sine theta was the was the uh, um, the magnitude of the uh, vector a, okay, plus cosine theta, j hat. Okay. 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 So this makes sense on how we uh, how we express the unit vectors in the stationary coordinates in terms of the uh, um, the um, the local coordinates. And so the next step, now that we have this, is just to simply plug these guys back into our original equation. Okay. Okay. And so if we do that, remember our original expression was we had u x, which was the component, the x component of the vector u in the stationary coordinates, and then we're going to multiply this by. Normally, we multiply this by i, but instead of i, let's plug in this expression right here from the previous page, okay? And so we have u sub x times cosine theta i hat minus sine theta j hat, okay? Plus u sub y. And normally we, we multiply this by j, but instead of j, we're gonna plug in this expression right here. So we have sine theta i hat plus cosine theta j hat okay all right and then all this is equal to ux um hat uh, times i hat plus uy hat j hat okay um so the question in the chat is the is the angle between a and b 90 yes it is so we have a, a right triangle right here yep okay um, and so now that we have it at this point, let's uh, let's rearrange the left hand side um, such that we have one term multiplied by i hat and another term multiplied by j hat. Okay. Okay. And so if we do that, we get the following. So we'll have u x cosine theta plus u y sine theta. 
All this is multiplied by i hat. Okay. And then to this, we're going to add um, minus ux sine theta plus ui cosine theta j hat, right? and all this is equal to u x hat i hat plus u y hat j hat. Okay. And so for this, we can uh, we can make two algebraic equations. Okay. And so we can make one algebraic equation uh, with regards to the um, i hat terms. Okay. Because in order for this equation to be equal, then those two terms boxed in red have to be equal. Okay. And then we can make another um, equation. It's kind of awkward because I did it on separate lines. Okay. We can make another algebraic equation involving the terms that are um, boxed in green because those two guys need to be equal in order for this expression to be the same. Okay. Right. So and so you know the reason we you know we kind of went through this whole exercise of, of replacing the unit vectors in the stationary coordinates is so that we can make these two algebraic equations. So we have you know something multiplied by i hat on the left is equal to something times i hat on the right. And then same thing, we have something multiplied by j hat on the left, uh, and that's equal to something multiplied by j hat on the right, okay? All right, any questions on, on this? Okay. Okay, um, and so if we do that, um, so we'll, we basically have two equations. Um, so then we can basically put this in matrix form kind of in the same way that we've done with a lot of other stuff in this class. Okay? So we'll have ux hat ui hat okay, is equal to cosine theta sine theta minus sine theta cosine theta. Okay? And all this is multiplied by ux ui. And then from this uh, expression, you can see that we've arrived at you know something that we, we want. Okay, and so using this system here, we can take any arbitrary vector, and so you know our arbitrary vector will be given by its components u x and u y. Okay, um, and then all we got to do is we got to multiply this vector by this matrix right here. Okay, and then we'll be able to transform um, back and forth in between the stationary and the local coordinates. Okay, and so you know in this particular equation, we can solve for the coordinates. In the local system, given coordinates in the uh, in the in the stationary system, okay. And so we just multiply by this matrix. But if you wanted to get things in the local system or in the stationary system, um, you can just multiply by the inverse of this matrix over here. Okay. And so this matrix right here that I've highlighted has a special name. Okay? And so this guy is known as the transformation matrix. And it's usually given the symbol T, okay? And it's equal to just this guy up here. And so just for shorthand, because it, it's, it's you know, you'll see it's, it gets a little bit cumbersome to write cosine theta, sine theta, sine theta, cosine theta. Um, usually we just give it the shorthand. So instead of cosine, we do C. So instead of sine, we do S, okay? And so we have a negative S on the bottom, and then we have a positive C down there, okay? Right? And so this transformation matrix is basically the key to transform vectors in between the local system and the stationary system. Okay. okay. And so what we're going to do at this point is now that we have this transformation matrix, we can start to apply this to our element stiffness matrix in order to get the element stiffness matrix in the stationary system. All right, any questions on, on this? Okay. So let's go ahead and, and, and start doing that. Okay. So let's, uh, so let's say that we have a, a, an element. So let's say that we have a bar element, although you, you can apply the same thing for a spring. Okay. 
And let's say our bar element looks something like this. Okay. And so it's not perfectly horizontal. And so it's skewed by an angle of theta right here. Okay. And so usually when we have a bar element, we usually uh, label the nodes here. Okay. So we'll have node one on the left and then node two on the right. And so within, uh, within the system local to the element, we have um, forces and the, uh, um, and the corresponding displacements, right? And so the force on the node one can be denoted as F1X uh, with a hat, okay? And then the, the corresponding displacement of that node can be U1X with a hat, okay? And then we'll have the same thing on the right-hand side here. And so on the right-hand side, we'll have F2x, which is the force that's on node two pointed within the, uh, um, you know, within the same axis of the element. And then we also have U2x, which is the local displacement of that node, uh, again, within the local system, okay? And so if we wanna express kind of the, the local element stiffness matrix, it wouldn't look something like this. Okay. And so we have our nodal forces on one side of the equation. And then we have our element stiffness matrix, where for a truss, it looks something like this, right? So we take the area, cross-sectional area of the element, multiply by the Young's modulus, divide by the length, and then multiply by this matrix right here. Right? And then this stiffness matrix will relate the forces to the displacements. Sorry, two X. And so that's just our element stiffness matrix for a truss, um, kind of just written out like that. Okay. okay. And so uh, you know that's that's the that's the element stiffness matrix that we've been working with so far, and the one that you can use for one D problems. Okay. And, uh, so in order to expand this to two dimensional problems, we need to actually include the other uh, axis, right? And so right now we have um, you know the local x axis pointing this way. But we also have our local y-axis, which is pointing uh, perpendicular to that, okay? And so in order to properly apply our transformation matrix, we need to expand this matrix in order to include y hat, okay? okay. And so the way that we're gonna do that is just we're gonna add rows and columns of zeros because um, right now we assume that the bar element is only gonna be displacing within the x hat direction, okay? And so we're gonna expand it in order to have the kind of the, you can think of them as kind of placeholders for the y hat direction, but they're just gonna be zero because you know there's, there's nothing here. Okay? And so when we, uh, when we expand the system, instead of just a, a two, uh, a two um, equation system, we're instead gonna have a four equation system, okay? So it's gonna look something like this. And so on node one, instead of just having one um, force, F1X, we'll also include F1Y, which is the, uh, the nodal force in the Y direction. Okay. Okay. And so in addition to that, we'll have uh, the same thing for node two. And now we have our element stiffness matrix. So our element stiffness, we still have our uh, coefficient in front. So that's the area multiplied by the Young's modulus divided by the length. Right. And that's multiplied by our local um, our local displacement vector, okay? And so you can see here, we've, we've included, you know, equations for y, but because this row is entirely zero, that's, that's just gonna be, you know, zero. And so even though this, this system's bigger, these two guys are equivalent um, because we've just kind of padded it with zeros in order to include the, the y. But in order to actually apply our transformation matrix, we need the displacements in the y direction. So we kind of just added them as, as placeholders.
All right, any questions on, on this? Okay. Okay, so the next step is uh, we want to transform these local, um, um, you can keep think of them as vector components, um, u1 hat, u1, uh, u1 x hat, u1 y hat, um, into uh, the stationary coordinates. And the way that we're going to do that is with, um, you know, our transformation matrix. Okay? And so if we write out our transformation matrix for, let's just say, node one, right, it would look something like this. Okay. And so we have the, uh, um, you know, we just, I basically just applied our transformation matrix from before where we have the, uh, the, the, um, the components of the vector in the local system, right? And this is, this is equal to the transformation matrix multiplied by the same, the same vector, but just, uh, you know, in terms of the stationary coordinates, um, the vector in that system, okay? And so we can do the same thing for node two, right? And so we have these two, you know, transformation systems, but in order for them to work with their element stiffness matrix, we need to kind of combine them into one, okay? And so the way that we do this is we're just kind of, you know, just kind of stack them on top of each other. Okay? And so our full system would look something like this. Okay. And then we have our transformation matrices. Right. And so this is kind of the, a little bit of a, of a leap right here because, you know, we're going from two by two systems to a, a four by four, right? But we need to keep in, keep in mind uh, which um, nodes or which degrees of freedom are interacting with each other. Okay. okay. So it might, it might kind of seem like I pulled this uh, matrix out of my ass, but um, let me kind of highlight some things just to kind of make it a little more clear, okay? And so what I box in, in blue right there, you can see that that's our, our two by two transformation matrix, right? And so the reason I put them in these locations here is because U1 X hat and U1 Y hat are only interacting with, um, with U1 X and U1 Y, right? And so those locations, in order, for, in order for this system to still be um, applied, we need to put this transformation matrix into the top left of our kind of four by four system, right? And then for um, U2X and U2Y hat, uh, those only interact with U2X and U2Y. So in order for that to happen, we put the transformation matrix in the bottom right of our, um, of our, of our four by four system, okay? And so if you can imagine, you know, if we had something here, so we can say that, you know, so maybe we had like a cosine right here, right? Right, so if that were the case, we would have, uh, and we just kind of multiply across the row, we get u2 x hat is equal to cosine theta u1 y, right? Um, plus uh, cosine theta times u2 x plus sine theta u2 y, right? And so that would be false because node two and node one, you know, since we're just transforming coordinates here, then those guys shouldn't interact. So that's why this system kind of uh, has the form that it does. So it looks strange, you know, especially going from a two by two system to a four by four, but that's kind of the reason why I put, you know, these, uh, these matrices in where I did, okay? Okay, and so what we're going to do is that now that we have this kind of a transformation four by four, is we're gonna apply this to our element stiffness matrix to, uh, in two locations. So we're gonna do this for both the, uh, the forcing vector and also the displacement vector. Any questions on, on this?
Okay, so let's go ahead and do that. And so remember our, our, our element stiffness matrix had everything with a hat. Okay? So we're gonna replace everything with a hat with this kind of matrix system here. Okay? And so um, on the left-hand side, we're gonna have um, this. Okay? So we have our transform system. So we have cosine theta, sine theta, minus sine theta. This should be cosine. Getting a little ahead of myself. And so this is the uh, the forcing vector. So instead of you know having everything with hats, now that we've applying this transformation matrix, everything doesn't have a hat. Okay. And so this is great because remember um, our goal here was to express our element stiffness matrix in terms of the stationary coordinates, right? And so basically everything with a hat we need to replace with everything without a hat. And the way that we do that is with this transformation matrix. Right? And so this is going to be equal to, um, to AE over L multiplied by this. Okay. And so our element stiffness matrix, it's, uh, it's, just a, it's just a matrix of material constants. So there's no transforming here. Right? And so the only thing that we're actually transforming is, is just, the, uh, just the vectors. And then to the right of this, we're going to have um, our displacement vector, uh, where again, we're going to replace the expression with hats with this expression with no hats. So again, we're going to have our, our, um, trans our, our transform vec um, matrix. again, you know, we replace a vector with hats. So u1 x hat, u1 y hat, u2 x hat, u2 y hat with something that doesn't have any hats. Okay. okay. Um, and so just for, uh, just for my sanity, um, and probably for your guys too, I'm going to replace these with, with some shorthand notation. Okay. And so I'm going to replace this, um, this big matrix here. Um, let me use a different color. Right, so I'm going to replace this big matrix here with a big capital T underline. Okay. Okay. I'm going to replace this vector um, of forces right here with F uh, with F um, arrow on top. Okay. The element stiffness matrix, or, or at least a base one, will be K. Okay. Right, so we have our transformation matrix. Um, so this is the same one. So it's still going to be T uh, under un, underline. Okay, and then we also have um, our displacement vector U. Okay, so if we write this in kind of shorthand notation, we have T underline multiplied by F vector is equal to K underline T underline U um, U um, U vector. And so at this point, you know, uh, we're almost done. We just kind of have to um, move one of the transformation matrices over to the right-hand side, um, and then we'll we'll finally get our element stiffness matrix in the stationary coordinates. Okay. All right. Any questions on uh, kind of the process in which we used to uh, to get here so far? We're almost done with this, and then we'll do uh, we'll do an example right after this. Okay, and so uh, what we what we want to do is we want to kind of put every all the transformation matrices to the right, and so we're going to multiply both sides by t inverse. Okay, and so by multiplying by t inverse, that's going to get rid of this t on the uh, on the left hand side. Okay, and it's going to put everything on the right. And so let's go ahead and do that. Right? So you have f vector is equal to t inverse underline times k um, underline times t underline u um, u vector okay and so you're probably wondering you know what is t inverse um, and so t inverse is just the inverse of our t matrix but it turns out this t matrix is kind of a, a matrix with special properties and so taking the inverse of this matrix 
um, is the same as just taking this transpose. So it's a special, special little uh, matrix. Okay. okay, and so you know the 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 last part of this uh, of this derivation is simply just performing the matrix multiplication for all these guys right here. Okay, and so everything that I boxed in purple right there, that's going to be our element stiffness matrix in the stationary coordinates. Okay. And so uh, if we perform that matrix multiplication, so, um, you know, um, you, can, you can do this yourself just to verify, um, or you can just kind of trust that the textbook is telling the truth, right? And so if we perform that matrix multiplication, our element stiffness matrix and the stationary coordinates, which I'm denoting as T stat, right, is going to be AE over L, okay, multiplied by this, okay? Right, so remember our notation. So any C is just a cosine of theta. And so we have cosine squared theta, um, cosine theta times sine theta, and that's uh, and then minus cosine squared theta minus the, uh, the product in between the two. Right? Then we have sine squared minus cosine sine minus sine squared. Okay? Then we have cosine squared, uh, cosine sine, and then sine squared. And so I, uh, what you'll notice here is I only gave you half of the matrix, and that's because the other half is symmetrical. Okay. And so all you have to do is kind of just fill out just that upper right-hand portion, and then just reflect that guy down into the, uh, into the bottom. Okay. Uh, and so if you want kind of a full expression to, uh, to write in your notes, um, I can go ahead and kind of fill out the rest right here. Okay. So we have CS minus C squared minus CS, then we have minus CS, minus S squared, and CS. Okay. And so if you want the full matrix in which you can kind of just plug in just based on the angle, this is this guy right here. But I just wanted to point out that, you know, across the diagonal right here, then, uh, then the matrix is symmetrical. Okay, so it took us quite a while to get here, but now we're kind of ready to start doing some 2D problems. And so with 2D problems, all we have to do is, is we uh, just use the same process that we did before. But when we're computing the element stiffness matrices, we use this guy, uh, which has all our cosines and sines, so that we can deal with elements that are kind of pointing in whichever direction that we, we want. Okay. Excuse me, Professor. Yep. The first, uh, the first row is that c squared instead of c to the s. Yeah, it's c squared. Yes. Okay. Thanks. Yep. Mm -hmm. That would be a very interesting expression. Cosine theta uh, raised the power of sine theta. Um, that would be very uh, interesting. <laughs> All right, uh, so let's do an example. Okay. Just so you can kind of uh, you know, get used to uh, doing this calculation. Okay. And so in this example, let's say that we have a, a, a bar element and it's angled, it's tilted um, 30 degrees with respect to the horizontal. So it looks something like this. Okay. And so this angle right here is, is going to be 30 degrees. Okay. And so if we have these the following properties, we say that A is equal to 2 inches squared. Okay. L is equal to 60 inches. And then E is 30 times 10 to the 6 PSI. Okay. Um, what we want to do is we want to compute the element stiffness matrix in the stationary coordinates. Okay. So we want to compute K stat, right? Okay, and so when you're faced with these 2D problems, um, you know, and you're going element by element, the, I, I find that the most convenient thing to do is, to, is just to compute what is cosine of the angle and sine of the angle, just so you kind of have them ready, okay? And so since our angle is 30 degrees, we have cosine of 30, okay? And so cosine of 30 is, uh, root three over two. Okay, and so sine thirty is just going to be one half. Okay? And so now that we have cosine thirty, or cosine thirty and sine thirty, all we need to do is just to plug these guys in for k stat. Okay, 
And so K stat is going to be AE over L. Okay. And so we know these guys, but I'm just going to leave it as, a, as just a, a variable expression for now. Okay. And then we need, just need to go through and just start performing the, uh, um, the computation. So this part is, you know, it, admittedly, it's, it's a little bit tedious, but, you know, once you um, kind of get used to doing these, then you kind of get into a rhythm and it's not so, it's, it's not so difficult after that. And you can just say like, you know, cosine squared, sine squared, cosine theta, sine theta, some, sine theta something like that. So, you know, when you're first doing these problems, it, it definitely takes a while. I'm, I'm not going to, uh, um, you know, say that it's not going to be annoying. Uh, but once you get used to them, they, they become easier. Okay. So let's do the first row together. So the first row, we, the first thing we have is cosine squared, right? And so we're gonna plug in root three over two squared, okay? Because that's cosine of our angle squared. Next we have cosine theta sine theta. And so that's gonna be root three over two times one half. Right? Next we have minus root three over two squared, okay? And then we have minus um, cosine theta sine theta, which I don't have room for, so we can just plug this guy in. Okay. And so you could, you basically just kind of keep doing this. So, you know, the form that I had before with the, uh, with the symmetric matrices, that's usually pretty um, helpful because then you only have to fill in half. And then once you fill in half, you just kind of fill in the rest of the matrix with that. And so since we know that this, this first row right here, right? Um, so after we compute that first row, because we know that this matrix is symmetric, we can go ahead and fill in the first column with the exact same things. Okay. And so this guy right here will be the same as this one. So this will be root three over two times one half. Okay. Next we have minus root three over two squared. And then finally we have minus root three over two, one half. Okay. So I just took, I just took the row and I kind of just transposed it into the column. Okay. And so that's the, that's kind of one trick that you can use to, to make this go, this process go a little bit faster. Right. And then the rest of this is just kind of plugging, kind of plugging and chugging all that stuff. Okay. So you're going to get a, a full matrix. So there's not going to be any zeros here because 30 degrees is kind of a weird, uh, not a weird, but it's, it's not a convenient angle. Right. Um, but, um, you know, once you got, once you got that, then you can just, uh, you know, plug everything in. All right. Any questions on, uh, on this example? Okay, um, and so that's how we compute element stiffness matrices in the stationary coordinates, right? And so before we do kind of a full, a full blown out uh, 2D truss problem, uh, I'm gonna go over just one more, uh, one more concept, and that's the computation of stress. So I think someone asked about this uh, either last week or the week before that. Um, and so, you know, now that we're doing things in 2D, uh, we can actually compute the, the stress. You could do this in 1D too, but um, you know, the, the formulation is pretty different in 2D, so that's why I kind of uh, waited until, until now. And so remember what the stress uh, conceptually is. So the stress represents kind of the internal forces that are within the element uh, or within the structural uh, element that holds the, the system in equilibrium. So you can kind of think of it as the amount of uh, load that your material is holding just to make sure that your whole structure doesn't fall apart. Okay? And this is you know, one of the really nice benefits of FEA just in general. So we, we saw this when we did our plate with the whole example in ANSYS is that you know, in ANSYS uh, or in any kind of finite element software, it's really easy to compute stresses where normally it's, this is something that's really difficult to measure in practice. Uh, and so, you know, computation, a computation of these stresses is something that uh, FEA could do really well. And these stresses are often of a very strong engineering interest because, you know, once this, once the stress um, reaches over a, a certain threshold, then your material and your structure is just going to fall apart. So there's a lot of interest in, in determining what these stresses are. So you can properly do like a safety analysis on your, on your building. Okay, so the symbol of stress is, uh, is given by sigma, okay? So that's kind of the traditional symbol. And the way that we're gonna compute it is we can simply just take um, one of the forces on the element. Um, so you can do either F1X bar or F2X bar. Um, there, you know, uh, usually doesn't matter, okay? And then we're gonna divide it by area, okay? Because remember the units of stress is, uh, um, is a force over an area. And so what we're doing here is we're taking the nodal force along the direction of the element, okay? Okay, 
And so we take a force along the direction of the element. That's why we, that's why we have this hat right here, right? So remember the, the local coordinates go along the direction of the element. And then we're gonna divide that by the cross-sectional area of the element, okay? Okay. Um, and so uh, what we're gonna do now is we're gonna replace this F2 hat using um, our displacements, using our displacements and our element stiffness matrix. Okay. And so we can say that F2 X hat is equal to AE over L times minus one, one uh, U hat, okay? Where this U hat right here, this is a vector of U2 um, X hat and U2 Y hat, okay? And so all I did there was I took um, kind of the last row of our element stiffness matrix, our kind of our, our OG element stiffness matrix before we brought in, you know, 2D stuff. And I just kind of isolated this right, right here, okay? And so this is our expression here, um, but you know that this is um, usually not convenient, or at least not in terms of the stuff that we're computing, because we're not really computing this guy right here, right? And so we're, we're, we're not actually computing our displacements in the local coordinates, we're actually computing them within the, uh, um, within the stationary coordinates. So, you know, uh, so when faced with these kind of things, we can uh, use our transformation matrix in order to get this in terms of the stationary. And so uh, expressing this in terms of the stationary coordinates, we get the following, okay? Uh, and so just like before, we're gonna expand this guy. And so instead of a two, uh, you know, a two degree system, since we're doing our stationary coordinates now, we have, you know, four degrees of freedom, okay? All right, so we have uh, minus one. 0, 1, okay, um, minus 1, 0, 1, and then multiplied by um, our stationary displacement vectors. So we have u1, x, u1, y, u2, x, u2, y, okay. And I think I have, I have a typo right here, so this should be, um, there should be no y coordinates here, so there should be 1, u1, x hat, and u2, uh, x and so we've expanded that, so now we include our y coordinate, and, and more importantly, we've included this to uh, to be our stationary coordinates. Right. And then, in order to kind of make this work, in order to kind of make that substitution between local and stationary, we have to include our transformation matrix T. Right there. Okay. And so that's kind of our, our big T. Right. And so all we got to do in order to complete this uh, this equation is we just got to multiply this this vector here in green. We just got to multiply that vector, and then we're going to multiply that by our transformation matrix, and then we'll have an expression for which we can compute the stress. Okay. Oh, we got to divide by area too, but area just kind of cancels out. Okay. All right. Any questions on uh, on this? Okay. So let's go ahead and finish up that expression. And so if we uh, divide by A and just cancel that out and perform that matrix multiplication, we simply get that the stress in an element is equal to the Young's modulus divided by the length times cosine uh, minus sine times, uh, or minus cosine, sorry, minus cosine minus sine, cosine sine, okay? and then multiplied by the displacement vector of that element in the stationary coordinates. We have u1x, u2, or uh, u1y, sorry, u2x, and u2y, okay. And so with this expression right here, after you solve, um, you know, the finite element problem, and you solve for this guy right here, right? And so just like, you know, you've been seeing in homework one, you know, once you invert the linear system, you get displacement at all the nodes. And so once you have the displacement, all the nodes, you just simply plug it into this formula right here and you get the stress within that, that, that element, okay? All right, any questions on, uh, on how we got to this equation here?
Okay. And so let's uh, let's put it all together and let's uh, and let's actually solve a, a trust problem in in two D. And so this problem actually is, is going to be a combination of trusses and there's there's going to be a spring in there. Uh, just so you kind of uh, don't forget about springs. And it's a nice it's it, it's kind of a nice um, example too because it shows you how to deal with springs in two D too. Okay. And so let's say that we have um, a situation that looks like this. So we'll have we'll have a three element system. So let's say that we have a bar element, we'll call this A, okay? And it's gonna be fixed to the wall up here. So this is a, a vertical bar. Okay. Uh, next to that, we're gonna have a, a spring element B, okay? And that's gonna be uh, skewed. And finally, we have another bar element C, and that's gonna be perfectly horizontal, okay? And so the angle between these guys, is this gonna be 45 degrees? And this angle right here is also gonna be 45 degrees, okay? Let me label all our nodes. And so we'll have this node be node one, this node up here will be node two, this node here will be node three, and this node here will be node four, okay? And then in order to force the system, we're gonna pull down right here. And then the magnitude of this force will be 10,000 pounds. Okay? And so just kind of following conventions from before, we'll say that the load um, will denote it with the symbol P, okay? Okay. And so in addition to, in addition to the geometry, uh, we also need to know some of the uh, material properties. And so for A and C, we know that these are truss elements. So for trusses, we need to know three things. We need to know its cross-sectional area, we need to know its Young's modulus, and we need to know their length. So let's go ahead and list those out. Okay. So first, let's do the Young's modulus. Okay, so the Young's modulus is gonna be 30 times 10 to the six PSI. Our area is gonna be two inches squared, and our length is gonna be 10 feet. And so element B is a spring. And so for a spring, you only need to know one piece of information, which is the spring constant. Okay. And so our spring constant in this case would be 250,000 uh, pounds per inches. And so in this uh, finite element problem, what we're interested in solving for is the uh, global display, is the uh, displacements at all the nodes, okay? And so in order to do that, we're gonna follow the same process as before. We're gonna write out the element stiffness matrix for, uh, for all three elements, A, B, and C, okay? And we, now we know how to do that because you know, we know how to do um, 2D um, element stiffness matrices. And so once we do that, we can assemble into the global system. Um, we can then apply boundary conditions, solve the global system, um, and then get our displacements. Okay, uh, any questions about the, uh, the problem setup? Okay. Okay, uh, so the first step is the element stiffness matrices for all the elements. Um, and so we'll just kind of go right down the line, right? So let's start with element A, okay? And so since we're dealing with the 2D problem, remember the first thing that we, that we like to do is we like to write out um, the values for what cosine of the, of the angle is and sine of the angle, okay? And so for element A, we know that our angle is 90 degrees, okay? And so cosine of 90 degrees is gonna be zero, right? And then sine of 90 degrees is gonna be one. And so Ka, right? Okay. And so if you actually perform the uh, um, uh, the arithmetic with the cross-sectional area, the Young's modulus, and length, you get five times ten to the fifth. Okay. And and then you plug in all these numbers here. So this is a simple case because we have a lot of zeros, and then what we get is zero, 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 zero. 0, 1, 0, minus 1, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, minus 1, 0, 
one. Okay. And then this is multiplied by the, the nodes that, uh, um, that govern this. And so since element A is connected to nodes one and two, we're going to write out the degrees of freedom for nodes one and two, right? So we have U1 X, U1 Y, U1 or U2 X and U2 Y. Okay. Okay. So that's the element stiffness matrix for, uh, for element A. Um, so we're lucky in this big, in this case, cause it's vertical. So we have a ton of zeros in the system, right? The zeros are your best friend because that's uh, something that you kind of forget about. And so we won't be so lucky for element B. So element B, the angle is gonna be 45 degrees, right? And so cosine of 45 degrees is gonna be root two over two. And then sine of 45 degrees is also gonna be root two over two, okay? okay. And so K, for KB, um, what we're gonna do is, um, the constant out in front is just gonna be K. Um, which is the spring constant. So this is 2.5 times 10 to the fifth. Okay. And then we're going to perform all the multiplications here. So, um, um, so even though this is going to be a, a full matrix, at least it's relatively simple because everything is just root two over two. And so the only question is, you know, whether the terms are going to be positive or negative. Okay. And so if you plug everything in, you get the following. So you get one half, one half minus one half, minus one half, right? And then we have one half, one half, minus one half, minus one half, okay? Then we get minus one half, minus one half, one half, one half, minus one half, minus one half, one half, one half, okay? And then out here in front, um, you know, I kind of ran out of room, but remember, you know, when you're writing these element systems, you need to keep track of what, of what nodes these systems are touching. So um, element B is connected to nodes one and nodes three. So this is gonna be U1 X, U1 Y, U3 X, U3 Y, okay? And this is transposed because it's a really horizontal, okay? Let me draw this a little bit more clear. Right. Okay, so that's the element stiffness matrices for the first two elements. And so the last one we have to do is element um, C. Okay. Um, and element C is going to be another simple one because we have a, a pretty good angle there. Okay? Uh, before we do that, are there any questions on, on this guy? Okay. All right, so let's look at element C. So element C, our angle is going to be zero, right? And so cosine of zero is one and sine of um, zero is going to be zero, okay? And so KC is going to be equal to, um, and so KC has the same, um, the same uh, uh, material constants as, um, as A. And so the constant out in front will be five times 10 to the fifth. And then the uh, stiffness matrix will look like this. Okay. And so, uh, um, you know, in, in addition to this, we need to keep track of what nodes that element C is touching. And so element C is touching um, node one. So we have U1X, U1Y. Right? It's also touching node four. So we have U4X, U4Y, okay? Okay. All right. So those are the element stiffness matrices for all the different elements. And so now that we have all the element stiffness matrices, the next step is simply going to be to assemble, okay? And so unfortunately, with the, with the limitations of this iPad, I'm gonna try my best, but I don't know if I'm gonna have room to uh, to do everything on here. Um, but basically, you know, because we're in a two we're in a two D system a two D um, system here, and the fact that we have four nodes, and so our global element stiffness matrix is gonna be eight by eight. Okay. Right. 
So it's going to be big. So I, I think you're, you'll have more, probably your, you'll have more room when you're writing your own notes. Uh, but this iPad is, is kind of small. So, you know, we'll, we'll see kind of how this, this goes. And so just like I usually do, let's, uh, let's label all of the, uh, the columns here. Okay. So I was barely able to squeeze it in. It's gonna be much harder to write numbers though. So I know that's uh, almost impossible to read, but basically this column vector right here is uh, just all of our nodal displacements um, for each of the nodes. So it goes U1X, U1Y, U2X, U2Y, U3X, U3Y, U4X, U4Y. Okay. Um, so let's go ahead and start, uh, start filling this in. Okay. And so for U1X, U1X, and so the only actors that we have for this are element C and also uh, um, element B, right? And so if we, uh, if we perform the addition, so from here we have five, okay? I'm gonna assume that there's a, a 10 to the fifth out here, okay? Just to uh, um, make sure that I can try to fit everything, right? And so from element C, we have a five right here, okay? And then from element B, we have a 2.5 divided by two. So this can be five plus 1.25, okay? And then for U1X and U1Y, we only have a 1.25. We have a 1.25, okay? And then again here, this is five plus 1.25, okay? okay. Um, and so basically, you know, this assembly process is just the same as before. So you're gonna be matching up basically um, degrees of freedom that have the same, you know, um, location based on the elements dipsis matrices. It's just, it's, it's kind of on steroids because uh, you have to do it kind of a lot. Um, so I'm going to fill in um, the rest of this. I'm going to see if I can fit everything, but uh, if not, then you can, uh, you can see a much more clear version uh, in the lecture notes. Okay. Are there uh, any questions on this while I'm um, filling this in? Okay, um, so that's the that's kind of the the big boy. Um, so you can see, you know, these matrices are are fairly big. So definitely take your time with these, making sure that you're adding the elements dipsis matrices uh, in the right locations, um, so that um, you know you can go about doing this, um, you know, um, doing this well. Okay. Okay. So now that we have this uh, this global system here, our next step is to apply boundary conditions. Okay. And so applying the boundary conditions will actually wipe out a ton of this matrix. Um, because uh, most of our nodes here are going to be fixed. Okay. Um, before we do that, are there any questions on, on this? Okay. 
So our next step is apply boundary conditions. Okay. And so in this case, we have a, a ton of fixed supports. So we have um, nodes. I think nodes two, three, and four are all fixed. Or in this case, I guess they're, they're uh, yeah, we can say they're fixed. And so when you have a, a pin support or a fixed support like this, um, you eliminate basically both of those, um, both the degrees of freedom, okay? And so what this is basically saying is that U2X is equal to U2Y is equal to U3X is equal to U3Y is equal to U4X is equal to U4Y. And all these guys are equal to zero. And so what that means for the matrix is that you're going to modify rows three, four, five, six, seven, and eight. Okay. And so you're going to modify them according to, um, you know, the Dirichlet boundary conditions. Okay. And then for the Neumann boundary conditions, we only have one in this case, right? And so for the Neumann boundary conditions, what we have is a, uh, um, a load of 10,000 uh, pointing downward on node one, okay? And so the way that we apply this is we put minus 10,000 on the right-hand side vector on, or on the forcing vector, okay? And we're gonna put that in the same row as U1Y. And so you can go ahead and apply that and you can rewrite base for our eight by eight system. Um, so I'm not gonna rewrite it again, but you know, I think you guys kind of know, right? And then once you have that eight by eight system, you can plug that into MATLAB and you can solve for the displacements. And then what you get is this, okay? So I'm not gonna write U2X, U3X and uh, U4X and all that stuff, because we know all those are zero. And so the only displacements that are gonna be of interest are gonna be at node one, okay? So we can compute uh, U1X, Okay, so U1X in this case is going to be 0 0.0033 inches, okay? And U1Y is going to be minus 0 0.0167 inches, okay? Right? Okay, uh, any questions on, on this example so far? Okay, um, so one more thing that, um, that we can do with this example, um, you know, just before we did this example, we learned, you know, how we can compute stresses. And so let's do that. And so in this, um, in this particular, um, you know, example, we had two truss elements. So we had elements A and C. And so let's compute the stresses in these, uh, in these elements. And so to do that, we're simply just going to use our um, our formula here. Okay. Yes, yeah, sigma is equal to e over l times minus cosine minus sine cosine sine. Okay. Multiplied by our displacement vector. Okay. And so for um, element a, we know that theta is equal to 90 for element a. Right. So we have e over l. Cosine 90 is going to be 0. Minus sine 90 is going to be minus 1. 0 and 1. Okay. And then we're going to multiply this by the displacement vector for that element. So element A, um, you know, has, is bordering nodes 1 and 2. And so let's write out the, the displacements for nodes 1 and 2. So we have U1X, U1Y, U2X, U2Y. Okay. And if we do that, then we get a stress of 4,175 PSI, okay? okay? And the fact that this is a positive number tells us that this element is in tension, okay? Or in other words, this, this element is being pulled apart because the, uh, the stress is, is positive.
right? So we can do the same thing for element C, right? So element C, our angle is um, zero, okay? And so we plug in um, zero degrees into this expression up here. We have minus one, zero, one, zero, okay? And then we're gonna multiply this by the degrees of freedom that border um, element C, right? And so that's U1X, U1Y. And so the other node that borders element C is node four. So we're gonna have U4, X, U4, Y, okay? And so we plug in all the numbers from our solution. What we get is sigma C is equal to minus 825 PSI, okay? Right, and so the fact that it's a negative number tells us that this element here is in compression. So that's kind of an, an important distinction in between um, the two. And so when you get a positive value, that means the element's in tension. A negative value means that it's in compression, okay? All right, any questions on, uh, on this? Okay. Okay, so we're almost out of time. So we only have, I think, three and a half more minutes. And so let me just go over kind of one quick concept that we'll pick up on the next time, okay? And so, so far, uh, and so this concept has to do with uh, the supports actually, so the constraints, right? And so, so far, we've only looked at supports that look, either look like this, right? So with the elements either sticking into the wall or the element might have something that's like this, right? Okay. And so the, uh, the, the actual name for this kind of support is a pin support, right? And any support that you have that's stuck into the wall is a fixed support, okay? And so for our purposes right now, these, these two are effectively the same, but, but starting on, um, on Wednesday, we'll see that there's, there's gonna be some differences in between these two. But there's a third type of support that you're probably already familiar with, right? It literally looks like a, a, a roller skate. And these are called roller supports, okay? Okay, and so what's uh, the reason uh, fixed supports and pin supports are the same uh, for our purposes right now is that they knock out both the degrees of freedom. So they're gonna knock out both the X component and the Y component of our displacement. And so a uh, rower support, probably as you, you've already familiar with from your previous classes, these only knock out one of the degrees of freedom, okay? Okay. And so the degree of freedom that it actually knocks out is the direction that's perpendicular to the, uh, perpendicular to the support. And so if we draw our stationary coordinates like this, and we have a roller system like this, right? And so what this system says is that, you know, the Y direction in here is perpendicular to the surface. And so this roller support will say that U, Y, let's say U and Y is equal to zero, okay? But U one X is actually free. So, you know, that's something that we're, we're still gonna solve for in our system, something that's still gonna be part of our global, our global stiffness system. And so by comparison, if you have a roller support that looks like this, okay? Um, and so the way that we solve this is we say that you, um, since the X direction here is perpendicular to the wall, we say that U one X is equal to zero, okay? Okay, um, so that's a, a roller support. So next time uh, when we pick it up, uh, we'll do an example that has this roller support. Um, and then we'll, uh, we'll finish up this unit on trusses, okay? Um, so that's, uh, so uh, we're all out of time today. Uh, so thank you everyone for tuning in. Um, I'll, stick, I'll stick around for a few more questions, but if not, uh, have a nice evening and I'll see everyone on Wednesday. Yeah, professor? Yep. Mm -hmm. Could you please show me the case station in matrix? Maybe I have some type on it. The, uh, the transformation matrix? Yeah. Let's see. 
it was yeah, 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 thank you. Yep. Let me make sure that I didn't do a typo too. <laughs> <laughs> okay. All right, so there's a question in the chat of what chapter is this in the textbook? So this is the, uh, um, so we're still in the, uh, the first textbook. So this is the Logan textbook. And this is all chapter three in that textbook. Yeah. So we're not going to do every single section in here because, uh, you know, um, that's kind of a lot. And I kind of want to get to the, the stuff um, after the midterm. So we're just kind of doing select sections in this, in this textbook. Mm -hmm. But all this is chapter three stuff. Right, so the question in the chat is, uh, can I show where the Neumann forcing vector goes into the matrix? Uh, I can definitely can do that. Uh, so are, um, are you done with this uh, transformation matrix? I'll take that as a yes. Um, so I see that there's a question on the midterm. So I'll, uh, I'll, the, that, uh, the date for that should be in the syllabus. So check that out. Um, that date um, hasn't changed yet. Uh, but let me answer this question on the Neumann forcing vector first. Thank you, Professor. Yep. Okay, <laughs> I'll write it right here. Right. And so our uh, forcing vector here is going to be eight by one because we have um, eight um, eight nodes, right? Or eight degrees of freedom for our four nodes. Okay. And so when I say that this Neumann um, uh, this ten thousand force goes in the u one y u one y is in the second row of the matrix. So we're going to have a zero minus ten thousand. That's like on the very edge of my iPad. Okay. okay. And zero, 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 zero. Okay. Um, so we have an eight by one and then the minus 10,000 goes into that second, uh, second slot. Mm -hmm. Yep. Steven, so the, uh, the textbook is, uh, um, it's the Logan textbook. So it's the, I think the first one listed in the, um, and the syllabus. So I don't know what the publisher is. It looks like it's Thompson, I guess. Um, but yeah, so this stuff is not in the, uh, it's not in the Wiley textbook. It's in the, it's in the other one. And so let me check the, uh, the date for the midterm. Midterm is planned for Wednesday, October 7th. So that's going to be, I think week six, I believe. Oh no, week uh, seven, looks like. Yes, so it's it's, uh, it's um, planned for Wednesday of week seven. That's going to be the midterm. Mm 